It is a petition for a special law regarding a fire cadet program for the City of Boston's Boston Fire Department. This matter was sponsored by Mayor Martin J. Walsh, referred to the committee back on January the 16th of 2019. This special act seeks to give the Boston Fire Department the authority to establish a cadet program to recruit and train more women and people of color to serve as active firefighters. Existing state law dictates that the fire department's hiring process, making it challenging to increase the number of women and diverse candidates into new recruit classes. This special act will allow the Boston Fire Department to recruit Boston residents between the ages of 18 and 25 years of age to serve as fire cadets receiving on-the-job training and performing civilian duties within BFD headquarters in firehouses. Upon completion of the program, cadets may receive preference on the list of eligible candidates for up to 33% of the upcoming fire recruit class. This hearing is being streamlined on Boston City Council TV online, is also being recorded, and will be broadcast at a later date on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964. We've been joined by uh, my colleagues, City Councilor Tim McCarthy and City Council Josh Sakem. I know that there are other colleagues, in, including Council President Campbell, uh, who is uh, on her way to the chamber shortly. We're also joined by in administration officials, uh, Danielson Tavares, who's the Chief Diversity Officer, um, Juan Sanchez, Diversity Officer for the Boston Fire Department, and Vivian Leonard, a Director of Human Resources. So if my colleagues have any opening comments, we can get right into it with the administration. Um, I know that uh, there'll be representatives here uh, from Firefighters Local 718 as well, and uh, they'll be recognized uh, to testify if they so choose. So with that, I'll turn it right over to the administration. Uh, Danielson, if you wanna just uh, name and affiliation and for the record, and you have the floor to tell us, give us your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Councilor. Um, Daniel Sinsavaris, Chief Diversity Officer for the City of Boston. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, just wanted to um, get, come here today and, and go in support of, of, of this bill. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, when you think about our public safety offices, um, a, a lot of our issues are um, pertaining to the way civil service laws are structured. Um, the, the cadet program is something that was created in the Boston Police Department in 1979. Uh, and so we've had a lot of success with the cadet program over there. <clears throat> some prominent folks who have gone on um, in the Boston Police Department uh, to hold leadership positions include former Superintendent Lisa Holmes, um, current um, Commissioner Willie Gross, and former um, Boston Police Commissioner Billy Evans. Um, I think, you know, when we, when we talk about the cadet program, um, I, I think, you know, there, there are questions around a cadet program within the Boston Fire Department. Um, it's something where, um, you know, civil service law ha has really hindered the progress we've been able to make over there. And just, just throwing out some st statistics, um, currently 95% um, of all our FTEs at the Boston Fire Department and 72% of all uh, employees um, identify as male and white. And just going back a little bit farther in terms of history, um, back in um, the early 1970s, the Boston Fire Department was under the Bleacher Decree, um, which dictated a one-to-one -one hiring ratio uh, until there was parity in t the city of Boston. In the year 2000, that parity was reached. At the time, the Boston Fire Department was 40% pe um, people of color, and the city of Boston population, 38% people of color. And so essentially, the, the Bleacher decree, decree was uh, scrapped because it was deemed that parity had been reached at the department. And so if we look at what's happened since, we are currently at 28% people of color at the Boston Fire Department, and, and that's now with the city, that's about 54% people of color. Um, so it is a process that um, I understand why the process is, process is the way it is. I think we all pay homage to our vets and want to see the best for them. But I think it is a, um, a process that was meant well intended, but it has had some unintended consequences. And I think a cadet program um, is one remedy to the solution. Um, cadet programs are something that are picking up across the country. We've identified at least 14 cities across the country that have established cadet programs. And they vary from um, holding positions for veterans as well as public school um, um, kids. And so there's a lot of um, best practices out there that I think um, we could bring to the city of Boston as well. And I'll leave it to uh, Juan to talk a little bit more around um, some of the outreach efforts we've had within these departments um, and some of the successes they may or may not have led to. Uh, Good morning, Council. Uh, Juan Sanchez, Boston Fire Department uh, Diversity Recruitment Officer. Um, just briefly, uh, just kind of one of the things that we've done um, as far as outreach for the Fire Department. Um, 
we've definitely come into um, some obstacles along the way, but uh, we've had some minor successes in creating some pathways for um, our teens. We feel that uh, reaching out to the demographic that uh, of a younger age um, could create potentially uh, um, a huge um, a, a huge contingency of, of young kids to do the do what they need to do in order to get on. So giving them the information that they need uh, to get onto the fire department, uh, whether it's joining the military or, or finding that path to kind of the fastest and most uh, beneficial way for them to get on. Um, we started a, a teen fire cadet, uh, teen fire academy, if you will. Um, which is a summer program that we started. It's going on its third year. Um, we started with uh, 22 teens, all inner city kids. Um, we partnered up with uh, ABCD uh, with the program. They uh, they um, basically got, they were allowed a grant and we kind of hopped on to that grant and we were able to get these teens. We started off with 22. The following year, last year, we uh, we increased that to about 40, and we partnered up with ABCD and BCYF as well um, to get, uh, I think we had 38, I'm sorry. And then um, this year, we're hoping to get 40. Same thing, ABCD and BCYF kids, <clears throat> all inner city. And the Teen Fire Academy um, is basically a teen program. It's a summer job. Um, it's an eight, six to eight week program. It depends, it all varies, but. Um, we shoot for eight weeks, uh, and basically they get the insight and uh, of what it takes to be a Boston firefighter. Um, they do some, you know, basic fire skill training, basic fire skills training. Um, they go down to Moon Island. They train with hazmat, tech rescue. Uh, we also include a military week <clears throat> where we have uh, each branch of the military come in, spend a day with the kids, and have them understand what it is to be a veteran or, or what it is to be in the, into the military and the benefits of that. Um, and this year we're implementing a civil service week as well. So um, with that, uh, we kind of give them options for Boston police, um, sheriff's department, things of that nature to try to kind of increase their options when, you know, it comes to that time for, for them to go to get onto the workforce. So it's a career development program. Um, and it's been pretty successful so far. Um, we're still kind of working on some of the details um, of trying to uh, trying to get these get the kids to kind of understand the ins and outs of the job. Um, but we've had some some pretty good successes, and uh, the the program seems to be growing in, in popularity as well. So um, among that, we hired a woman's liaison as well, uh, Margaret Conley. Um, she's been with us and we've been working together, um, you know, for the past year now, I want to say, uh, going out to high schools and, and colleges and, um, doing a lot of community outreach and getting out there and, and trying to build up, um, a visual of, of a, a female veteran that's, you know, has, has had a, a big success to us like she's a great asset for us uh, she's been great out in the in the community out in these recruitment um, in those recruitment um, the uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank yeah <laughs> in those recruitment fairs I'm sorry like career fairs and recruitment fairs we kind of bring her on to those and and she's been real helpful in getting the word out and trying to increase that female presence for us um, so uh, those are two big things that were just uh, career fairs, um, high school fairs. We're starting an explorers program with a partnership with BPS, hopefully in the fall. Uh, it'll be an after school program. Again, these are all focused on young teens. Uh, we feel that that's probably the best route for us. Um, <clears throat> Aside from because the exam dates are biannual, so we can only recruit for so we have a, a small window for recruitment, you know, during that year. So we try to get to as many community meetings. So on a recruitment year, so say we have one in 2020 coming up in the spring, we focus like in the fall, we start to put together a team, a recruitment team, um, and it's all veterans on the job, male and female, um, all from the neighborhoods that we try to. Um, 
demographic specific more or less to try to increase the diversity numbers so we really try to go into those neighborhoods that are uh, majority minority and try to increase the awareness of the exam the cost um, try to you know have them understand the waiver program that we have uh, if money is an issue um, so we really we really try to gear up that team and really try to get out there um, starting typically in, in right around September and October to try to push that agenda to try to increase diversity and have those people take the exam. Um, although our numbers have been dropping um, as far as people taking the exam, um, we're trying to curb that by just our presence. And, uh, and I think uh, some of the, uh, we've had issues with some of the negative press around the diversity stuff uh, on the fire department. So I feel like that's kind of had an effect ultimately on people taking the exam. And I think cost is an issue um, as well. Um, but we're working on increasing, you know, uh, programs and working with Margaret. And um, I, we feel, again, like I said, reaching out to the young, young teen and giving them that pathway uh, is beneficial. But the plan that we have in place is a long-term plan. <clears throat> and and that's just due because the way the exam works and how we hire in the process and the limit the, the, the limitation on the classes that we have uh, We don't have the benefit of just hiring people as they come uh, We don't have the ability or capability of hiring people um, Without the exam and, and that there's this kind of a process in order to get on so with that being said it, it kind of limits us on on um, the people we can hire and the demographic specific that we are trying to reach out to. And just quickly, I think you'll notice Juan mentioned a lot of educational stuff and outreach that's going on at BFD, um, and that's great, but I think at the end of the day, it's an entry point issue. We can do all the outreach right. and recruitment that we right. want, um, but until the process changes, I think, I think this is what we're stuck with. And just to give you a quick snapshot, um, the Walsh administration has implemented three cadet programs in the Boston um, Police Department in the last five years. Just want to read you off a few of those numbers. In 2016, our first class, 35 cadets, 63% uh, people of color, 34% female. Uh, 2018 class, 39 cadets, 70% people of color, 30% um, female. And we have another class going in this year, uh, 20 cadets, uh, and the aim is to shoot for a class of 50% female. Um, <clears throat> there is money committed in the budget next year for an additional police uh, cadet program and an additional $150,000 set aside uh, for the implementation of a fire police, uh, fire cadet program as well. And we, uh, I apologize, and uh, I completely, we also do a lot of uh, our recruitment around veterans as well to try to, um, you know, mm -hmm. that's the, our quickest option. Um, so reaching out to the veteran community, people who are transitioning out, um, from their service, we work with a program called PAYS. Uh, it's a PAYS program which allows us to give um, recruits who are, you know, they basically give us a template of recruits who are, be, are getting out uh, within a month or two. And we work with the transition counselors from each military base to try to focus on those specific people from Boston and the demographic that we're looking for and try to reach out to them, email them, let them know about the exam. Uh, and try to increase um, our, our outreach efforts that way. Um, working with the PACE program and, and trying to increase that veteran presence because that feel, I feel that that's our, our quickest option to okay. transition them We're into the BFD from the, uh, from the military to, okay. to getting on. Yeah. And Vivian, anything to add? Sure, so Councilor Flaherty, first of all, I'd like to thank you, um, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Flint, and Councilor McCarthy for um, taking up this order and partner with us to push this forward to the legislature. Um, I think it's relevant in that I would um, support what Donnie has stated. The civil service law structure has not kept pace with who we are as a society today. And if we are truly committed to um, having a, dis a workforce that is reflective and diverse um, and creating equity and inclusion, this is the next step. I think it's relevant to note that the civil service exam is only given for public safety. All other um, employees who 
are signing up for civil service, it's provisional and they go and they sign on a list. There are no exams beyond public safety. So I think that speaks volumes because um, I think it was well intended when the civil, structure, civil service structure was um, established and there was exams for all um, jobs and various titles. However, now to have it come down to public safety, and you know, you think it's ironic because these are the areas in which we struggle in terms of having a workforce that is reflective of our um, population. So it goes without saying that we have to give people opportunity and hope, and the only way to do that is to look at what are the other ways of establishing an entry point and some of this is definitely looking at the fact that, you know, as Juan has stated, um, hands-on opportunity. So to do the outreach and let people know that these opportunities are available to them, but also that we as a city are opening the door and we want people who are reflective of our population. And so therefore, we're going to do whatever it takes in order to put some measures in place to... Um, equalize the playing field, if you will, and to bring in that diverse employee population because it's important to think about who are the individuals that we are serving. You know, I give all credit to the police department and the fire department for the work that they do. It's very difficult work, but we also want children to be able to see and imagine what would it, you know, take in order for me to obtain that job. You know, if I see someone who looks like me, I have the ability to emulate them, I feel comfortable approaching them and asking them, what would it take in order for me to have your job? I think that's where we want to be as a city, that's the tone that we want to sit as a city, and so, you know, I would encourage all of you to support this moving forward. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Vivian. We've also been joined by my colleague, City Councilor Ed Flynn, City Councilor Kim Janey, and City Councilor Frank Baker, just coming in. Um, so uh, just to start, uh, just a line of inquiry, um, and I think that uh, Juan sort of touched the nail on the head in terms of to get sort of our, uh, the best bang for the buck, uh, it's probably going to be uh, trying to get um, recruit women that are coming out of the military, including obviously the, the Coast Guard as well, just based on the nature of their uh, training and experience and their exposure <clears throat> to some of the hazards of, of, of this particular profession. Uh, a lot like politics, firefighting is very hazardous and um, I know that um, for some, and for me, for example, this building's on fire. I, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I'm trying to find the door out. I'm not trying to get on the roof and yeah. swing an axe to create a hole to vent. I'm not looking to, you know, hang around flames too much. But So I think it, it, it sort of goes part and parcel to um, our recruitment efforts, uh, you know, we were going to see the sort of the biggest gains, and I think it's going to be if, if we can attract women coming out of the military and sort of introduce them to, to this profession uh, is one. Two, um, you had cited the cost of the exam. What is the cost of the exam? So for an individual to sit for this test, it costs how much? It's two hundred dollars. It's two hundred. Oh, it's actually one hundred and fifty. I apologize. One hundred fifty, and then on yeah. average, how many Boston residents take the test every time it's offered? So uh, it varies, um, and we also have a military makeup exam that, that is um, basically every quarter, which those numbers, uh, you know, change the, the, the number every quarter pretty much. But um, at the end, before the military makeup, we had somewhere around eight, 800 and 900 that took the exam in 2018, I want to say for the 2018 exam. Okay. Um, those numbers might have jumped again because of that quarterly makeup exam for veterans returning mm -hmm. home that weren't able to take the exam at the at the date of the exam. Um, so that could be anywhere north of 1,000 right now, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think, is it, if this is a sort of a, um, if this is sort of an impediment, I guess, to folks willing to sit for the test, right? So to Vivian's point that, you know, someone that aspires to, to be there or see someone that, uh, they emulate and they want to maybe join the department, but it's cost prohibitive. Does it make sense for the city to, to waive the fee for all um, applicants? Um, is that too cost prohibitive for us as a city, given that this is a really important issue for us? And if we really want to attract and recruit, um, you know, the best possible candidates for the department and we want to make sure that uh, we're offering it to everybody, 
does it make sense in 2019 to just offer the test uh, for So free? that might be a possibility. There is a, currently there is a waiver provision for um, public safety individuals who want to take the exam and can demonstrate mm. that perhaps they don't have the funding right. because maybe they have not worked right. in a while. Um, but that is an idea. Right. I remember when I, I took the civil service exams, um, uh, sort of back in the late 80s, early 90s, they were, um, I want to say at the time, it might have been like 20 or maybe 25 bucks. Um, and they did have that waiver form. Uh, it's now $200. It's a different right. type of animal. I think we waive it for everybody. Uh, it's a civil service exam. You sit down and uh, you, you fill out the, the ovals and you submit it into a machine. Have to think, other than the test monitors, the test sites and the test monitors, that's probably really where the expense is. Uh, I would make an argument that we should offer it. If you're a resident of the city of Boston, you should be able to come in, sit for the police, fire, and EMS <coughs> test, and, and that should be free of charge as a resident and as a taxpayer. Not quite sure what that will cost the city. Just do the raw math. It's mm -hmm. 200 bucks times 800-ish, somewhere there, maybe 1,000 people take the test. Roughly. And but maybe that number will now go up a little bit because it's free. Yeah. But I think that might be a worthwhile uh, endeavor just to sort of say, hey, we, we want to try to recruit the best and the brightest. We want no impediments. We don't want people to have to file disclaimers and waivers and just, um, you know, uh, onerous additional paperwork, what have you. You want to submit to the test, your name, address, date of birth, and you get the test site, you go in, you take the test. I think that would help us in our recruit efforts, but also the diamond in the rough, that person that would love to do it, always wanted mm -hmm. to do it, but can't come up with 200 bucks. That cost is also reflective of the PAT as well. Yep. So uh, where previous years, the PAT and the exam fees were separate. Um, so they would charge you an exam for, they, they would charge you a fee for the exam, and then they would charge you another fee in addition to taking right. the PAT. And where the police make the, the mistake on that, it's, and it costs us a lot of money, it's, it's, waste, it's wasteful spending. The Boston police give you the PAT um, at the end of the process. Okay, so they're going through the, and it's probably about 40,000 per recruit. Recruit investigation, mm -hmm. you take the test, recruit investigate, neighbor mm -hmm. assessment, the drug test, blah, 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 blah. And at the very end, before you're actually finally admitted, you do the PAT. I argue that PAT should be at the very beginning. And if you pass the PAT, then you move on to the next step. If you don't pass the PAT, there's, we don't have all that wasteful spending going into recruit investigation, background checks, uh, drug testing, all of that stuff. We eliminate that on the PAT. Um, I don't know where you guys do the PAT. I would also argue it, that the PAT the, should be in the very beginning. Yeah, it's, it's part of the, it's part of your PAT score is part of your score of getting on gotcha. to, to take the next step. Right, on the police, if you get to the last stage, which is the PAT, and if you mm -hmm. can't pull, you know, the, the trigger pull, yep. uh, the bag drag, or getting over the fence, we should know that very early on, as opposed to dumping $40,000 into the recruit investigation, only to end up with, um, you get two tries at it. Mm -hmm. I, and again, that's just just trying to eliminate wasteful spending, but try to capture that money and allow everyone to take the test for free is one potential. You also mentioned, uh, Juan, the veteran piece of this, which uh, often gets uh, lost in this equation. Not only do you, you need to be a veteran, you now actually need to be a disabled veteran coming onto the job. And I think we really need to uh, take a sort of a deep dive on that, uh, respecting the work that our veterans do and honoring their commitment and their service to our country. Absolutely, no doubt about it, and that preference should be there. Um, it, but it should be a preference for Boston residents and Boston veterans. Um, you know, and what we're seeing coming onto the job are, are folks that grew up in completely different parts of this country. But <clears throat> whether it was their point of entry or when they come out and then they have the additional option when to declare their residency, it puts Boston residents at a huge disadvantage uh, when someone's coming out of the service and they have that large window as to where to, to, uh, to claim their residence. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing coming on the job over the last several years is you know, all over the place. Um, I'll use like, you know, Oklahoma and Texas and Florida. And again, when I call 911, I want, it, I want someone that can get down to Columbia Road pretty quick. The guy from Oklahoma is gonna look at a map or they're gonna be pointing, oh, take a right, take a left. It's like, um, and, and you know, seconds and minutes are very precious in those situations. So I, I want those jobs for city kids. And I think we lose a little bit there with respect to allowing such the wide range on the veteran's preference. I, I do respect and honor veteran's preference. I want it to be there, but I want that veteran's preference to be for a Boston resident, a demonstrated Boston resident. They grew up in the neighbors of Boston, they joined the armed services, enlisted, they came out, and they're going on the job, not 
someone from grew up in Mississippi and went on the job. And, and that's where the residency rules kind of apply for these right. veterans that are returning home that are Massachusetts enlisted veterans. They have 90 days to establish residency in, in the city of Boston. So technically, they are Boston residents under the residency right. laws that are in place. Right, and that's um, why I think there's a loophole there and as opposed to it should be like everyone else. You have to demonstrate your residency in the city of Boston for a very specific period of time. They get a 90-day window to mm -hmm. declare once their service is over. And I think therein lies the issue. If we're able to eliminate that, then I think we provide a greater opportunity for Boston residents who are not only veterans, but for Boston residents in general, because the competition, it starts with um, uh, disabled veteran first, then veteran, then civilian. And so we get a couple of different hurdles here. So mm -hmm. in our efforts to diversify the department and to, to recruit uh, people of color and women, um, you know, we're hitting a couple obstacles. The main obstacle is civil service uh, and, and the objection that they have to some of the, these uh, initiatives that we're proposing, and also the, um, the issue of the sort of the veterans' preference, specifically as it pertains to disabled veterans, front of the line, then veterans after them, then civilians after them. And to your point earlier, we only, we're only putting on so many uh, recruits per class. So, uh, And then just finally, um, on the issue of sort of fostering additional diversity, I've talked about this during the budget process. We've, we, the previous administration eliminated two district chief positions. Um, and uh, we very much need those two district chief positions, particularly what we, we get the gas pipeline over in West Roxbury there without a district chief, mm -hmm. and also our very precious uh, and important Longwood Medical Area uh, over in the, the Mission Hill area. So uh, with, with our hospitals and whether it's mm -hmm. marathon bombing or you can go right through any list of it's, you know, it's the day and age today that having those two district chiefs, but the backfill on those two district chiefs between the captains, uh, the lieutenants, uh, would create a significant amount of diversity off of that list. And I think we continue to miss those opportunities um, to, again, foster what we're looking to, to do in this um, in this uh, home, this special law that's before us. So, so with that, I just had one uh, one question before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, the um, the um, in creating the um, in creating the, the the fire cadet program is the department open to renewing um, its previous request for a selective female certification list. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So, sorry. in addition to creating the fire cadet program, mm -hmm. is the department open to renewing its previous request for a selective? female certification list where we put in a very specific request that on the next class we need X amount of um, female firefighters. And I'd, that may be something that the commission Yeah, that, that would be something the no commission problem. would have to answer. I, I, I couldn't tell you um, if that was something that he would be in support of right. or, or not, but uh, I know that, you know, with Margaret Conley being the woman's liaison, we're definitely um, hoping that with her uh, on the rounds on the on the woman side that we can kind of try to find a way to increase our presence um, and, and focus on that right. on the woman um, <clears throat> the, the issue around the the, the lack of women uh, in the department right and I, and I would assume that the first her first task is to identify all of the women in the city of Boston who are currently in the service and or who have recently come out of the service and that yes. she's on the phone with those young women introducing them, introducing herself to them, letting her know about these opportunities on the Boston Fire Department and engaging in that dialogue. I think that's a first start y yes. for someone like, uh, for, for someone like Ms. Conley to uh, kind of, you know, just low-hanging fruit, if you will, in terms of that's an opportunity right there where you get folks that are either in the military now coming out that are physically fit, they're trained, they've been in... Uh, those types of situations, particularly like on the Coast Guard, you've got fire in the Navy, both, uh, and Council Flynn can speak to it, between the Coast Guard and Navy, you have firefighting experience, and maybe even the uh, the Army and the Marines as well, but um, right there is, uh, there's probably a group of, of potential recruits and cadets right in front of our face that we got to go and just knock on the door and introduce ourselves to, to those women. That would be very important. And Council, if I could just touch on a couple of points you've sure. made. Um, <clears throat> I do think um, this process is going to require us to be more intentional than that. Um, I think if you look at, just using logic, if you look at the numbers of veterans in the Northeast, um, the number of people of color in there are very low, even more so than women. So I think the preface is if we were to say, try to look at the women coming out of that service, um, that applicant pool is going to be very, very low. Um, the other piece around the testing, I think free testing is great, except the fact that taking a test does nothing for you if you're not a vet right now. Um, there's no incentive for a kid who's not a disabled vet 
to take the exam, even if, if, it's, if it's free, because you know you have absolutely no shot of getting onto the department. Um, the other piece you, you mentioned around potentially doing a selective list around women, um, that's something that HRD would have to approve. Uh, from my experience, those aren't things that they've been um, willing to do. Uh, for example, I know we've applied for language waivers. BFD has applied for language waivers in the past that have been denied by HRD. Um, so that's not one process that I have much faith in. And then the last thing I will say is um, it's interesting that the state has a different process when it comes to public safety than the city does. If you look at the way state um, police are assigned, um, they get two points for being a vet, whereas Boston um, Fire Department, you get absolute preference. Um, and so that's one process that I think could potentially be mirrored here in the city of Boston, is potentially assigning points for being a veteran rather than an absolute preference. Okay. Very and, good. And we've you. actually, we filed for um, uh, a woman's, uh, a, a woman specific uh, special cert through HID and, and it got denied. Gotcha. Um, uh, so we, we are trying to work with HID and trying to create a way or a pathway. Uh, if you will, to try to increase, you know, those numbers in any way we can by thinking outside the box in those ways, the, like the language preference certs are ways to do it, and we've been successful in that. Uh, and like Donnie said, like we've tried with the woman special cert, and that got denied through HID. Okay. Um, again, I feel that <clears throat> with the, I feel like it, it's not that you don't have a shot like a zero shot, I feel like we've, caught, we, we've been in a time of war and there's been a lot of veterans who've gone in. Um, so there's been an increase of numbers in vets returning home. So that, you know, that has a big, that's a big number of, of, of people returning home. I feel that we're kind of, that, that slowing down. We're seeing the veteran numbers drop as far as uh, vets taking the exam. So um, I feel like over time, I, I think that even being a civilian, you, you may have a shot. It, it could be a lot harder, and it could be to towards the tail end of the second year of that exam, um, like on the bottom of the list. But you could potentially get on as a civilian. It just may take a while. Um, but the last, you know, we've been in war over the last 10 years, so it's, oh, yeah. we've had that, that large group of veterans returning home. So those opportunities have been solely for those DAVs and veterans. But I think we're kind of reaching that that point where it's kind of hitting a lull, and I think uh, you know we're seeing less veterans taking the exam and less DAV. So I, I think we could see potentially in the next couple of years right. more civilians getting on. Right. Thank you, Juan. I think the commissioner testified he felt the same thing that we've been at war. I thought he mentioned sort of more like 20 years, and in yeah. reality, that's the, mm -hmm. that's that's a big piece. And so when we stepped off in this discussion, I want to make sure that we made a note of the veterans' preferences. Is a, is a you know it's a it's an uh, to block here to some of the things that we're looking to do uh, for better or for worse, for people's different opinion. I obviously respect and, and, and uh, believe we should have a veteran's preference and what form should it come in. Right now it's absolute preference. There are some that suggest that it should be points. I most definitely, I'm a city kid. I want to make sure that it's for city residents and I'm less concerned about the guy that served the country from Oklahoma mm -hmm. or Mississippi and, and, and Tennessee. Good luck to you. Thanks for your service. You clearly can go on the job in Oklahoma, uh, Texas, and Tennessee. Mm -hmm. but. They're coming here because it's a it's a great opportunity for them, and I want those reserved for kids in, a, in our city. But uh, I know Council McCarthy has been waiting patiently. Uh, he was first to arrive, so Council McCarthy. Another class already graduated in, <laughs> since you started. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Cheers. Welcome, everybody. Um, I went to the uh, graduation uh, last week uh, um, for the, the latest recruit class. There was a, uh, the first female uh, Vietnamese uh, recruit uh, graduated, which was uh, fantastic. Um, was she a vet? Uh, yes, she was. She was a, what? What branch? You know? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, the um, the issue that I have with the cadets, I, and we'll get into further the structure of the cadets, is that I feel like we're moving the goalpost during the game. Right? There's a lot of young men and women from Boston. And I'm not sure about the numbers from other states, which is numbers that I'd like to take a peek at because I think that's a I'm not really sure about that. I know other communities, kids from Weymouth, kids from Norwell, whatever, taking the test, coming into Boston. I'm not sure about the states, but we should get those numbers at some point in time to take a look at that. But I feel like the, the goalpost is being moved. And as somebody whose family um, has been serving in the Boston Fire Department, I didn't get on. Um, I took the test. I don't know what happened. I didn't serve, and I didn't get on. Having said that, between my wife's family, her dad's a retired district chief, her brother's a retired lieutenant, um, and uh, my family, 
between the two McCarthy clans, I married a McCarthy, which is probably, you know, it's weird, but whatever. Um, we, you know, we have probably 220 plus years of service to the city of Boston. Uh, my son's serving in the Army now, um, possibly with the thought that he wants to follow my brothers. Um, and if, if that, if you're moving the goalposts in the middle, that changes things, uh, which bothers me. There are kids, men and women, from the city of Austin who go into the military with the thought of, I want to be like my dad. Black, white, Hispanic, whatever. I want to be like my dad. I want to be now like my mom. We have you know, more women jumping in the service. So um, that's a great concern to me. How, how long would the, would the cadet class, what's the structure of the cadet class? So the cadet class now in Boston Police Department is two years, you're serving in a district, you know, all of that stuff. What, what would, what would the, the fire cadet class look like? Um, I, I, I think that's still something to be figured around, around, you know, just around what the class would look like and what the cadets would actually be doing. I think that's one concern we've heard is, you know, how do you get cadets on the job and make sure that they're safe? What would they be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's something that's still to be structured, but you know, I think it, it followed something similar to, to the Boston Police Department in terms of two years of service and then you go on with that preference, right? I think everything else is still to be spelled out in terms of exactly what that looks like. I do know that um, we've done a preliminary look in terms of what cities across the country have done in terms of formulating the program, what the cadets have done. Um, so there are some best practices and this is um, a conversation that's picked up around cities across the country. Um, so I do think we have some work to do in terms of figuring that piece out still. Okay, and as far as, you know, you were talking about the, the, the physical aspect of the job, um, even for the cadets, you know, I, I do agree with uh, my, my friend at Lodge Council from South Boston when he talks about um, the, the physical aspect of the job. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if we're gonna commit two years to a young cadet and he or she can't, to the physical aspect of the job. And this is, you know, this is gonna, I, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but all I know is that if, if, if I'm in a fire myself, or my brother's in a fire, or a firefighter's in a fire, and he or she goes down, I want somebody who can pick that person up and get them out. Mm. And, um, and, and if we're doing that because we're, we, we need to correct our numbers, and we're not focused on the actual job, and you're putting people in, in, in jeopardy, that's, that's a problem. And I know that you're, you're not pushing that by any stretch of the imagination. But it's important to understand that, that the, the people who go into those fires and they're, they're pulling you know, two inch hoses and they're battling a fire, they need to be strong enough and mentally strong enough to not only do their duty, but in the possibility of when bad things happen, they need to be able to pull firefighters out or pull you know, us out civilians, whoever's in that fire. So um, all of that has to come in. And, and I, I do agree that the, the physical aspect needs to start earlier because mm -hmm. I, would, I would think it would be a real waste if you had a cadet um, in there for two years and then ultimately he or she couldn't pass the physical to begin with. We've just, we've, we've had somebody for two yeah. years to, to do nothing. So, so there is a physical component as part of the cadet program at the Boston um, Police Department which they have to go through. Yep. And then to your concern, Councilor, around having the best folks for the job, I think that is a, that's a, that's a, that, that's a valid point. And I think a counterpoint to that would be um, having a 100% disabled vet class would, would also be uh, making sure that we're taking the best people to your point to make sure that building is burning, uh, that we do have the best folks on the job. Councilor McCarthy, um, just to go back to your previous comment, rather than looking at this as um, moving the goalposts, what I would challenge us to do is open our minds and say we're looking at this as um, establishing an opportunity for those who previously and historically were not made aware that these opportunities were available to them. And by way of example, I've talked to plenty of firefighters who would tell you that going way back when it was predominantly white, that you know they would have conversations with their sons or relatives and tell them, what was the best way to get onto the fire? Go into the military, do the following things, versus people of color who were not having these conversations because they were not made aware of the opportunity. I think we have to look at an eye towards the future in terms of how do we open the door to opportunity, and that's by um, certainly what's before you today, also the um, education and outreach that's being done at FIRE, 
um, there's a multitude of things that I think we must do in order to ensure that we're leveling the playing field for all people and that we're being inclusive and diverse. I agree. I would just state that the opportunity, the door of the opportunity now is, is the military. So there is a door of opportunity. Um, and, you know, then the argument from there stems to, you know, do you have to join the military to be a Boston firefighter? Mm -hmm. That's, the, I mean, that's the ultimate question. But the opportunity is there. So, um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just to, Good. Uh, just to touch point. base, uh, I'm sorry, just to touch base on that um, as far as awareness. Um, so, uh, I didn't touch this point when I was, you know, speaking and explaining about the Teen Fire Academy. That is one of the most important pieces of yeah. that Teen Fire Academy is um, having veterans of the job people of color, people who look like the kids who are participating in the program that are speaking and engaging with these kids for this eight week program. Um, they're letting them know exactly how they got on the job and they're speaking with them and they come from the same neighborhoods and backgrounds as these teens. So I feel like that's important. And that's part of the long-term plan that we have in place. Um, because right now with all the, the laws and, and uh, the veterans preference, we kind of have to, that's the strategy that we have to go is the long-term plan and building awareness. Thank you. And as, and as folks have arrived, Council Zakem was here early and had stepped out. Council Zakem. Mr. Chair, I'll just be, be very brief. I want to thank you uh, for your presentation, for, for speaking with us. And I think this is important. And I, I, I do acknowledge, I think Council McCarthy makes some good points <clears throat> on making sure we're getting the very best firefighters uh, in the city of Boston. But I don't think it's mutually exclusive uh, with the goal of creating a cadet program, with the goal of making our department more diverse when it comes to uh, whether it's racial, ethni eth race, ethnicity, gender. Uh, it's incredibly important that this fire department uh, represents or is more representative uh, of the population that it serves. And given, I think, the restraints or constraints, is probably the better word, of the state rules, uh, we need to be exploring all our options, that a cadet program is one of the few tools uh, really available to the city of Boston uh, to take some of those steps to address these sort of long-standing issues. Uh, I want to work sure to work with you all, with, uh, with the mayor, with Commissioner Finn, uh, to make sure this is done in a thoughtful manner in a way that's certainly going to protect public safety. But an important goal of this, though, an important goal that contributes to, I think, public safety uh, is making sure that we have people from the city of Boston um, as Councillor Flaherty says, who know their way around, who don't have to whip out a, a GPS to find where they're going in an emergency. Um, and we need to get this done uh, in some form, I think, in a timely fashion. So I don't have any questions right now, but I do just want to uh, reaffirm my support uh, for cadet program for the fire department because uh, it's an important tool. It's one of the only tools we have uh, to help diversify this department. Thank you. So thank you, Councillor Zakem. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Council President Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Flaherty, and uh, thank the three of you for your testimony and um, just for all that you're doing on this issue of diversity um, in our public safety agencies. Uh, Vivian, I appreciated your candidness, um, straight to the point, um, calling out the fact that civil service is only used for public safety agencies, I don't think is by accident. Um, this, you know, certainly involves politics and, and, and advocacy groups and lobbying, you name it, so I appreciate you naming it. Um, where do I begin? I, I guess I just want to say, you know, I, I absolutely support the cadet program. I think we have seen with the uh, police department that it's working, that um, frankly, we should have done it in the fire department a long time ago. But I think what's made, been clear by the, made clear by the numbers and the fact that we're going backwards with respect to the consent decree is that it, that this is not enough, right? Um, this is one step in the right direction, so I definitely want to go on record in supporting it, but in order for us to truly make sure that our public safety agencies are reflective of the demographics of the city of Boston, we need systemic change. We need to talk about civil service. We need to talk about the fact that it is not working. Um, we need to take it out of the framing of veterans against people of color, women against veterans. That's not what this is about. It really is about leveling the playing field and ensuring that anyone who wants to join our departments has an opportunity to do so. I do not believe that you should have to sign up to go to the military to become a firefighter in the city of Boston and then come back and 
come back as a disabled vet to get on or become disabled in order to get on to our fire department. I think that's ridiculous. And so the question is, what are we going to do to ensure that we create as many pathways as possible, understanding that the city can't do everything with respect to civil service. We, of course, can be advocating to the state for them to, to do something. If it's a point system, great. If it's not a point system, then do away with it. I mean, we have numerous uh, municipalities in Massachusetts that have done away with veterans' preference, have seen it work for various reasons. Um, some have decided to do away with it because they have been so disappointed by either the lack of resources that are coming from the state to cover the costs of civil service, or when they're looking to fill a job, they get five candidates. And they're like, that's ridiculous. These are serious jobs. We should be able to interview at least 10 or 15 people, and we're only sent five names. So they have done the work to demonstrate that this system isn't working. And rather than stay in that place, they've then said, OK, well, now what are we going to do about it? And so I have been pushing and will continue to push the city of Boston, including the mayor and the administration, to do something about it. The cadet program, great step in the right direction. Kudos to the administration and the mayor for putting this forward. Um, but it will never be enough if we're not doing other things, including tackling uh, the issue of civil service. Um, I'm all for folks who are born and raised in the city of Boston serving. Um, but I want to particularly pull something out, which is, number one, if we are serious about these departments reflecting the demographics of the city of Boston, that means more women and more people of color then what is the focus and intentionality around creating strategies to increase those numbers? Um, and we need more than just one sort of strategy. We need probably several um, and several entry points. And so I, I just want to name that. Um, and in terms of what Councilor McCarthy has said, that's come up as well. Folks who have signed up to go off to the military with the hopes of coming back to Boston, they're born and raised here, to serve. We could create laws or change things so that those folks are grandfathered in. There is different ways to get creative around ensuring that those folks who have left Boston to go into the military and are coming back with the intention of joining our departments um, are given that fair opportunity and that that commitment to serve is honored um, by grandfathering them in or coming up with other ways. Um, but if we're serious about increasing the number of women and people of color, um, we have to do a lot more um, than, than just the cadet program. So I, I guess my couple of questions are, um, one, and this is, I guess, directed to you, Tavares, which is, and the mayor has said this publicly, that we have released this data. I, I think he's confused, mm -hmm. unless something has changed. Um, because we talked about this in one of our earlier hearings related to this issue, which is releasing the data so that when you look at the public safety demographics of our departments, it's not just these civilian numbers coupled with the uh, sworn officers, that it's actually pulled apart. So that when you see the sworn officers, including the captains, lieutenants, the top tier positions pulled out by themselves, it is abundantly clear that they're not reflective of the demographics of the city of Boston. So where are we with releasing that data? Um, and then the second question is, what are we doing with respect to civil service? What are the conversations? The mayor has gone on record, whether on the radio or somewhere else, and said, going nowhere near that, which I think is a big mistake. Um, in the report I put out, it talked about just studying it, not even necessarily coming up with any changes just yet, looking at what are the benefits. We do get some benefits from being in civil service, including some of the costs that are covered by the state. But then what are the cons? What are the numbers? Um, and and what, do, what, do the, what does the data tell us where civil service isn't working? And then once we have a full understanding of that, we could come up with what we should be doing. It may be a two-point system, or we may look at the state police and say, frankly, absolutely not, because the state police is just as bad, if not worse. Um, but it cannot be an option where we're saying we're not going anywhere near it because of political fear around veterans and others who are going to step up and challenge us. What I have learned through this process over the last four years is that when you engage folks, including our veterans, in meaningful, thoughtful conversation about this issue, you invite them to be a part of the conversations. You sit down with them. They want to be a part of it. Some of the veterans are on the opposite side of the issues, opposite side of the table, yelling at me, are now suddenly showing up and wanting to be a part of the discussion. What I am learning, much of it comes from these veterans who are giving me firsthand data and information about ways in which we can do better. But to just say, no, we're not going to do it is a problem. So I just, those are my two questions. 
when is the data going to be released? And at some point, what what is our response with respect to civil service? Yeah, I think I think that's a great point in terms of making sure that we're looking at the data in terms of sworn versus at administrative personnel. I think if we look at the sworn numbers, um, it's it's what we would expect they get even worse, right? Um, I think when it comes to this debate, um, too many times it, it becomes um, you know picking sides, veteran versus non-veteran, veteran versus woman. Um, and I don't think that's what this is all about. I don't think anyone um, wants to do anything to hurt veterans. This is just about a process that isn't working. Um, and I think you know there's ways to do both, um, to take care of veterans and to make sure there's access and opportunity for those um, who want it, especially from Boston. Um, so I do hope to get um, more information soon on the breakdown from fire on those, especially leadership positions. And then the other piece would be just looking at the economic- When you say the breakdown, what do you mean? Well, to your point, um, the leadership uh, in terms of um, captains, lieutenants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think we're going to see just even in, le in leadership, it's not there as well. And then the other point, and another analysis point that I think it it's a valid point to look at would be the economic impact of those salaries and the dollars that are missing mm -hmm. in communities of colors. If you look at the salaries um, firefighters are able to bring in, I mean, there's a reason folks are, are gravitating to Boston to join these departments. Um, these are coveted departments. Um, and so I think, you know, there's huge economic opportunities being lost in these communities as well uh, for, for lack of access to these jobs. And so I do hope to have more information in terms of being able to dissect those numbers <coughs> for you in terms of sworn versus admin. Um, but I do think even in the administrative, in the administrative um, positions where we do have the ability to make those hires, we still haven't done enough in those ends as well. Um, so I do think, um, you know, um, continuing to put a spotlight on these issues will continue to hopefully move the needle. But just to c correct me if I'm wrong, right now the data with just the sworn officers is not readily available. So you can't come in and look at our boards and mm -hmm. see that data. The mayor is out there saying you can, and I'm saying no, Mr. Mayor, you cannot. So, and so, because why that is so important, it, yep. it paints the scope of the problem. Mm -hmm. So the data that we're trying to get internally that for the hearings, yep. great. People should be able to readily see that data, find that data. Yeah. Um, the departments clearly have it, right? Yeah. It's, their, it's so, our data. So, so one of the pieces on the data, we've been working to cut that data even more. I think part of what we had done initially was put the data on the dashboard, but then to your point, it gets confused in terms of what's sworn, what's personnel, what's admin. And so I think what we've been trying to do is say, okay, we need to do a better job in terms of paint a picture so everyone understands, okay, what's happening in leadership? What's happening in the sworn personnel? What's happening with our department heads? So people could start to um, dissect those pieces and understand what's happening in leadership, what's happening. Um, and respectfully, I agree with you. Right now, that data exists. It but is, it's not being shown on, on, on our public facing right, dashboards. That's what, so the and they will be going forward in the next cycle. Okay, great. Yeah. That, that's my request. The yeah. number one request when I, in terms of recommendations was release the data so if you're walking in as a lay person or on the website, you can see it. It doesn't paint a pretty picture, but at the end of the day, it puts us all on the same page saying we have work to do and people can do whatever they want with it. And then the second piece is what is the administration um, doing up at, whether in on our side, up at the State House to talk about um, civil service, what what's happening with civil service, sure. and that sort of goes in line with even this cadet program legislation, which is a home rule petition, any conversations at the State House as to the appetite to actually get this passed? Absolutely. So we actually sat down with the Mass Black Caucus just around this issue um, in terms of gathering support up at the state to be able to do something like this. Um, so I think, um, once again, it comes down to that political, political issue, right? Having folks that are willing to take a stance on this issue. Um, I think that's what we need, somebody to continue to champion this issue and continue to shine a spotlight. I am heartened by the fact that we have made the most progress um, recently because of all the spotlight that's been put on, on, on this issue. Um, and so I'm hopeful working with the Mass Black Caucus, we have been working hand in hand with them to be able to try to get this through. Um, so those conversations are taking place. Well, I wish you the utmost success. I mean, I, I want to be respectful of my colleagues who also have questions. Um, and one, one piece that I did not get to, um, which is also equally important, is, you know, changes within the departments at the fire department um, hearing. We were talking about <coughs> investments in racial equity training, all kind of training. Um, at the police department hearing, we were talking about training. And right now, we're still waiting on a request for, for information on who gets trained for sexual harassment and certain things. Not, not everybody, which clearly 
in order to shift culture within these departments, training on all across all different um, types of, or, of issues need to be conducted. And so that still has to happen, yes. um, but waiting on some follow-up on that, which is a separate piece, but just as important and, um, and essential to this conversation as well. You can recruit people to come here, but if they don't feel welcomed or supported if they're here, they're not gonna stay, um, and no one wants that. Thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by our colleague, City Council Lydia Edwards, uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Council Flaherty, and um, thank you to the panelists for being here and for your work on this important issue. Um, I just have a couple, couple of questions um, as it relates to some of the duties of a, of a cadet. Could you go over some of the highlights of what the job responsibilities would be for a fire cadet? Um, I think we still need to flush that out. Um, but just looking at what other cities have done, for example, um, there's been efforts in terms of recruitment. Um, there's been efforts in terms of administrative pieces that could be handled. Um, I think there are other safety concerns around the firehouses, mm -hmm. but I think um, programming um, is something that can be worked on. Um, but I do think that all stuff has to be flushed out. Would a cadet be, um, would a cadet join the, the firefighters um, on scene of a fire or on scene if there's an emergency uh, situation? I think that all have to be fleshed out. Can you give us a little bit of background on, if someone does become a cadet, what type of preference would they receive in terms of the civil service examination? So, so right now, the way it's structured, 33% um, of the recruit class slots in the proposal would go to um, the cadets. Um, their weights would not be weighted as heavily as veterans. Um, and so veterans still get a preference over the cadets and it wouldn't be the whole class reserved for cadets. It'd only be a portion of the recruit class um, coming in and that they'd only be eligible after two years of service going into those classes. Can you talk about some of the outreach um, or recruitment you have done or your office has done in the Boston public school system, especially with students in the JROTC program. I'm very familiar with them. I visit them frequently. Many of them don't join the military, but they love being part of the ROTC program in high school. What type of outreach have you done on to some of those students? Um, we did have a program, uh, it was uh, an explorers program that was uh, specifically based around the Madison Park JROTC program yep. with uh, Master or uh, Gunnery Sergeant Claher. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, we weren't having much success with uh, some of those teens being involved in the after school program. So we kind of, um, we put that on the backside and we're trying to recreate and redevelop the program to see if we could, you know, um, try to increase our presence in that ROTC community, uh, whether it's um, working with uh, different schools and having them all come together at a central location, uh, like different ROTC programs. Um, and we're also trying to uh, develop um, it, it's going to be similar to that exposed program, but, but that pre, our presence there wasn't that great for the after school program. So, um, I've had conversations with Sammy Schultz over at BPD cause they've had a pretty successful exposed program, but then after school program. So we're definitely working on creating a program of redeveloping, uh, that with the focus on ROTC students on BPS. When will that program be back? Looking at the f action? this fall coming, this okay. fall after the school year. Yeah, I think that's important to do that. It sounds like a great program. I've mm -hmm. heard good things about it. Um, we just need to make sure we designate some staff that are really serious about it, um, that, that want to work on that program as well. Um, the State Department of Veterans Services has a list of um, several thousand women veterans across across Massachusetts. Um, they communicate with them frequently on various conferences and update them on various um, issues relating to VA medical care. 
have you had any outreach with the State Department of Veteran Services specifically on women veterans outreach? We haven't, no. I'm not sure if Margaret Conley has, who is the woman's liaison, which, which that would be her focus. Uh, I know she's had several meetings, so um, I couldn't speak for her. So uh, I'm pretty sure she's doing, um, she's reaching out to as many people as possible in that, uh, with the focus on women veterans. Okay, could, could I ask if I can get a, um, a response on that from the department just on women uh, veterans issues? In, if you need my help, um, I was with Secretary Francisco Urena earlier today at an event, and I'd be glad to help out on any outreach on women veterans. Um, I have a good relationship with them. I've been in the military 25 years, so I'm also very familiar with the State Department of Veterans Services. They're doing great work, as is the City of Boston Veterans Services. Um, so I just want to get back to one question I asked earlier on the duties of a, of a cadet. I, I know it's still being worked on, but what is, the, what is your thinking about, what are you thinking about in terms of um, decision making on what type of duties or assignments that a cadet would participate in? Speaking of, uh, like, like, what, uh, like what factors are you considering, what challenges are you figuring about about what duties a, 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 a um, cadet could participate I in. I think those are things that we need to do some research on and, and eventually be flushed out through through the process of the study and, the, and looking into uh, the cadet program further. Is that is that one of the biggest challenges you have right now is trying to identify what the duties would be? Yes, well, I, I would say so. I mean, but. Uh, I think, you know, like any other program where we're preparing people to enter into a workforce, um, the training should be job related. So what does it mean to be a firefighter? You know, what um, particular things are you going to encounter and to prepare them for that so that hopefully they don't find themselves in harm's way because we've done the appropriate training that is necessary. I think once we start to zone in on that and figure out what that is, it's going to be job related and most certainly um, the fire commissioner and the chiefs are gonna play mm -hmm. a big role as the training academy in designing that training program. No, oh, okay. So that's still being discussed and being worked on now. Yeah, yeah and I think you know, as this um, legislation goes up to the Hill, these are conversations that are continuing to be had just around what are the functions, responsibilities. Uh, so as this process goes on, I think this, we just want to get this bill up to the State House. And I think all those questions are, are going to continue to be had and, and flushed out as, as we move along that process. <clears throat> I guess my, my final question is, what, what type of outreach would you be doing to um, people in the disability community that may want to participate in the cadet program or participate in the civil service examination, persons with disabilities, what type of outreach are you doing? Um, I think um, I would say I, we, we need to continue to flesh that piece out, but I would say um, currently um, all of our recruits are disabled vets. But are you doing any specific outreach to pe persons with disabilities, um, generally speaking, that may or may not be veterans? Yeah, disabilities in, in what regard? Anything specifically, or are you, are you just saying disabled yeah, persons in general? With, yeah, persons with disabilities. Um, I, I think we're doing an overall recruitment outreach. Um, I think we're kind of in the communities and we do a basic, you know, we have our basic outreach where we reach out to the communities and it's, it's open to the public. So it's open to whomever. So the information gets out. Uh, we work with community leaders and, and the community organizations to, to try to reach out to as many people as possible. Thank you. And I, one more time, one, one more question. Um, on language access issues, I know you are doing some outreach um, encouraging people to take the examination that may have a language that other than English that, um, can you talk about some of the outreach that you're doing to um, 
maybe our people that are English might be a second language for them. Um, I know they, they've, I'm, I'm, I'm proud that you were able to hire a, the first Vietnamese American. Um, but what about language access if you have a, a skill, a language other than English? What, what type of consideration would you be given? So those, those are all specific to HRD. Um, so we are only allowed a specific amount. Um, so we put in a request to HRD up at the state. Uh, they approve us um, on how many people we were allowed to hire um, in terms of language preference. Um, I know we've gotten denied um, several times for other languages. Um, uh, so that's kind of a work in progress, and it's it's kind of one of those things that if we get approved for it, but we'll we'll we do more specific outreach towards those language preferences that we get approved for. And, and just to touch quickly on the language preferences, I think they work a little bit differently in terms of BFD and BPD. Um, BPD has been more successful getting language waivers because I think. HRD is looking for justification as to why you need those. So as BPD, you, you have to have conversations with someone and maybe in, in another in lang other language, which I think BFD jobs are looked to be sort of more um, focused in terms of you're going in, you're putting out a fire, there may not be the need for that language piece, right? And so the other important thing to understand is that as you petition HRD for these language waivers, you have to go with the individuals that are eligible through the list. So for example, if the Boston Fire Department was approved for Haitian Creole, they'd have to pull that Haitian Creole speaking individual from the civil service list. Um, so it's not like they have the ability to go in and say, hey, we need a Haitian Creole um, officer who's out there. They have to still go through the list. Thank you, and then my final comment is um, the Mayor's Commission on Disability Access. Her name is Krista McCosh. Um, she might have some ideas to on outreach to the uh, persons with disabilities. In fact, they have an upcoming conference at the BCEC next month. I usually attend that, but they always have um, several, several thousand young people that do attend. Maybe it's an um, opportunity for the fire department to have a presence there and maybe do a little recruiting um, at that location. Take note, thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flinch, you recognize Councilor Baker. Everybody, <clears throat> thanks for coming out. <clears throat> and I know you, <clears throat> excuse me, answered, but uh, the preference for a cadet on police and fire is just a just a, a number, so you'd get five points ordered, added to your score, is that, what, did I hear that correctly? Yes, it's, a, it's weighted essentially, yes. Yeah, okay, and what is the conversion so, in dealing with the police, what, how many cadets go into a typical class is about 50, and then how many of those, whatever the, the number is, and how many of those actually get police jobs? So, so we actually requested from BPD, and I need to get an historical overview of cadets. Um, we have information for the Walsh administration and what those have meant for those cadets and the breakdown, which I can provide. Mm -hmm. But I think we're still awaiting a, a sort of overview of, you know, historically, what's the cadet program meant to the, the, to the Boston Department? What's it meant in terms of women? What's it meant for people of color? I know we've had a lot of great success stories in terms of commissioners that have gone on to become um, commissioners, and, and they had gone through the cadet program. Um, so that's data I can provide to you. Okay, no, no sense like off the cuff of what, of what, do half of them get in, a quarter of them get in, just no, do you have any idea at all? So um, I, I gave some numbers at the beginning of this. 20. So historically, just speaking historically about out of a class of 50, 20. Yeah, and then, and then Vivian, so like those other 30 that are there say, what happens to them? Do they go back at it the following year and try and get into the academy or is just, a, is it one shot? What? It's, it's typically one shot. Yeah, okay, okay. And um, so if 33% of the um, academy of class will be set aside for, for cadets, mm -hmm. so if it's 60 in a class, 20 of them will be set aside, how do we know that <clears throat> those 20 will go to cadets sure. if, if we're heavy with disabled vets? Um, you know, in, in that particular year, is there a way for us to make sure that, that 20 of those 60 will be set aside? Um, I, I, think, I think part of this is, is, I think that's the challenge, right? It, it's, it's how heavily weighted um, the veteran preferences. I mean, and even as, although we're doing the cadet program, there's no guarantee that these cadets are gonna um, supersede them in terms of where you're looking at the rankings. Right. Um, so I think, you know, 
um, these are best efforts to get the ball rolling on this process. Um, so we could potentially go through this exercise of a, of a cadet class and not get anybody on? Is that a possibility? Uh, potentially, and I think um, what we've seen is um, the, the, fire, the fire classes are typically smaller than the, the BPD classes. For example, um, the, the, la the latest Boston Police Department recruit class has some 95 odd recruits, whereas fire's generally looking at 45 to 50, 40 to 50 recruits um, per class. So it's also smaller classes, which make those jobs um, that much more competitive. Mm -hmm. Councilor Baker, what I would um, respectfully point out is that when you look at the BPD, um, cadet class and what that has resulted in over the years, I think you see a more diverse workforce as a result of that. So um, this is a step most certainly in the right direction, one of many steps that we must take, but I think we have to start somewhere and yeah. I think the results prove out over time and I think that's what's, what's required is us taking the right steps and seeing those steps prove out over time. Yeah, so even though we plan on setting aside 33%, it isn't necessarily gonna come to fruition. Yeah, and I think, I think as this goes to the process of the state, as we answer these questions, I hope either we are able to add some pieces that strengthen, or you know, to your point, address some of these issues on how, to, how can we strengthen the program to make sure that if we are setting aside 33% for cadets, that we're actually able to get 33% cadets in there. Yeah, I think it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's written in the legislation that those spots are specifically reserved for cadets on the cadet program, like for the, for the BPD. I, I, think that, uh, I think that that's in there, like that they're kind of slotted for them specifically. In so, new legislation? I think it's part of the old legislation that they had, you know, kind of refunded and re, like I think it's part of that old original legislation, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's in there. I'm, I'm not very... And, and then one other thing to mention is that um, the other reason it works so well in BPD is the cadets are often left um, going against civilians. And so when they're weighted, they're ahead of them, right? So yeah. we don't have as much of an issue in terms of BPD not getting to um, civilians because they're generally taking on larger classes, right? So they're trickling down to the civilians. Mm -hmm. um, so, Donnie, you do diversity for the city, the whole city, correct? That's correct. And you do diversity for, Juan, you do diversity for the fire department. Yes. What is your budget to do your job? Is it just your salary? Is it just you a one-man show? Yes. Just your budget? Do you have any, do you have any um, access to, to money if you want to do outreach? Or, so how are you supported, Juan? Uh, um, yeah, so I have, there's a kind of an overall budget that I have access to. Um, so I kind of, I, I mean, I do have access to the recruitment budget, if you will. Um, the, the diversity office kind of falls under that whole recruitment and HR. So there is, uh, there's no specific amount um, that I'm aware of, but um, I do have access to some of the funds that are there for recruitment purposes and, and things of that nature. Okay, do we, do we look at, a little off topic, but... Do we look at Massport and how they're operating? How, how, how can we, do we have any, maybe Vivian, you may know this, or, or um, are we looking at how they're doing their hiring? Because they're basically in Boston too. I, and I think I know one Massport firefighter and he's been on for, for 30 years. So what are we, are we as the city looking at Massport saying, hey, we have people that would like to would like to to get over there on, on your payroll. Are we, we looking at that at all? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, that's something I think we should be we should be looking at because it's that's a good job too. Um, are there any are there any other are there any other cities that are doing a, a fire cadet program that we know of? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we've list, we just. Quick overview, we, we've got um, Oregon, Ontario, Kentucky, Wisconsin, Maryland, Say, Tennessee. Slow down, Donnie. <laughs> I've got it. a good amount yeah. um, um, the, that we've identified, and I know it's growing, Oregon, um, Ontario, Kentucky, Wisconsin, uh, Maryland, Tennessee, Texas, New York, L.A. So those are all states doing, states doing cadet programs? Are yeah. That, like, is New York City doing one? Is, is yeah. So New York City. Um, okay. New York City is doing one. L.A. actually, um, Los Angeles City just um, had a, a recruit class of cadets going in all female class as well. Really? Yes. 
Okay. So there are some cities that are, that are, that are doing this? Yes. And I think the training will be, I mean, when you come back from, from a run, there's all maintenance and like you start an apprenticeship if you're an electrician, you need to know what the tools are. So that I think would be, would be a lot of that. Um, I think I'm good, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bigot. You recognize Councilor Lydia Edwards. I'm, um, I just want to go on record saying I do actually support a veteran's preference. My mother is a veteran, and I, I actually think it's an important uh, way in which a city or a town can acknowledge the service that the person has provided. But I do think it's important, and, and I appreciate you distinguishing between, uh, I guess, a veteran's preference and, a, like, and an automatic veteran's placement plan. And I think that that's what we're trying to figure out, how to thread that needle in a way that assures that we aren't just Bit your veteran status means you get a job automatically. Um, so part of, and you correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm understanding, I, yes, it looks like the cadet program will not be an automatic, you know, it'll still be countered or still have the civil service as the veteran's preference. But part of this is creating several pipelines that when the civil service falls, or when we've gone through that list, that we have the, the, the excuse that there's no one there or we can't find anyone should be eliminated through either this cadet program and other recruitment uh, pipelines we're trying to build. Is that, is that kind of the goal, to make sure that we're at that point? So I don't know if we'd ever get to that point where um, we're trickling down to civilians in a cadet program because we've exhausted the list of veterans. Um, to Councilor Flaherty's point, um, you know, most of the veterans we see coming in and applying aren't from Boston. And so we have a, 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 a great pool of, of veterans out there. And, and, and don't forget, you're allowed to establish residency um, from out of state. Mm -hmm. And we're only looking at 40 to 50 slots, maybe 80 slots for the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't anticipate with the salaries and the competitive nature of BFD um, that we're going to be able to somehow exhaust the list and say, hey, we've built a pipeline, and so now we can start to get those individuals in. I don't think that's a realistic. So then how does this cadet program support? I, I thought it was a good thing that we we're trying to recruit, reach out, and provide for qualified individuals so that we can be pulling from this pool of individuals, and you're saying that that's likely not going to happen? No, I think the cadet program does um, starts to get the ball rolling in, in creating that interest, um, educating the, these young individuals around what it means to become a firefighter, what the career entails, and the steps they need to prepare to take similarly to the Boston Fire uh, Police Department. A lot of those cadets will go through the program and say, you know what, it's just not for me, right? And a lot of those cadets will be strengthened by the experience they have through that. Um, so I do think, you or, know, it's important to do the educational right. piece as, as Juan's talking about, the education, mm -hmm. the making sure everyone knows what are the criteria to get into those departments. I think right. that's great. But in terms of actually moving the needles and actually looking at the numbers improve, um, I'm still wary that um, this, this is it. But I do think it's important With to With the current to civil steps. system in place. Yes. But I, I think it's... Uh, Go ahead. Oh, excuse me, Counselor. I think it's definitely a step in the direction, but it's one of many steps that we must take. Um, I think we continue to find ourselves in this vicious cycle where, you know, people get frustrated and over time file lawsuits. So if we are trying to think about this in a proactive way in terms of what are all of the ways that we can ensure that we're being inclusive, we're educating people about this opportunity, I think it's you know, a step in the right direction. Like Donnie said, I don't think we'll get to the point where we've like completely got to the point where there's no civil service list whatsoever and so all we're left with is civilians, mm -hmm. but I think we most certainly have a duty and obligation, if you will, to ensure that we are educating, recruiting, and speaking to as many people as possible mm -hmm. to make them fully aware of what are the steps necessary to become a firefighter. And I think that's where we can have an impact. Okay, and I, I do think one of the things I'm concerned about is that we do two years of investment and training, and I do think actually the program should be preparing them to be firefighters, even physically. So you mm -hmm. say these are the standards physically, you can get yourself together and do what you need to do to either build that strength um, so what could also happen is there's a lot of investment, time, and education put into preparing folks to be firefighters in other states, in other cities, in other times, because they can't get into the, the Boston Fire Department. So I think that's also worth noting. It's n not only folks coming in here to be firefighters with the veteran's preference, but that we will invest the time and money and lose them to those other places and other cities and towns, even maybe in Massachusetts that don't have it. 
or New Hampshire or Maine or other places as well. So I think that's also worth noting. We can create wonderful firefighters for other cities, and that would be, a, a I think, a lot of time and money wasted if we can't even prepare them to be in our own fire department. But I also wanted to just uh, note, I, I don't think it's a matter of and I don't think that's, I don't want you to think I'm mischaracterizing your statement, but I don't think uh, it's a matter of people getting frustrated and then filing lawsuits, right? I think that there, there has been questions, genuine questions about discrimination and systemic bias and issues within the Boston Fire Department, the police department and other, other places as well. So I don't want folks to think that it's just a matter of we're setting this up to prevent, you know, legal action, no. right? And I didn't... No, I want to. I know that's not what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, no, but I want to clarify. I'm going to finish real quick. Okay. Um, but but I do think that this is uh, the setting up this program is a good thing, and I do think that it's also a, 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 our dedication of our moral moral character as a city to assure that we have a pipeline, and the question is how that pipeline is stopped or narrowed by other systems that are already in place. Again, I do support the veterans' preference. The question is if that preference has now become a placement program, and is not actually is not actually doing what it's intended to do, which was to acknowledge the service of those in another capacity to the country, uh, instead instead of just making it an automatic pipeline to a really good job. So go ahead. Uh, counselor, I was speaking in terms of people who may have taken the exam and don't have the ability mm -hmm. to get onto the fire. So those are the individuals to which I was referring in terms right. of filing the lawsuits, mm -hmm. because now they're frustrated that they've taken this exam a multitude of times and two and three times and perhaps are not able to um, gain employment. So they are the ones that I was referring to in terms of filing lawsuits. Absolutely, thank you for the clarification. So uh, ultimately, I guess, um, I, I support this and I'm very excited to hopefully get this moving at the State House. But along with the recommendations that Councilor Campbell has come up with, I'm curious about your own, you don't have to provide them all now, what is the balanced or what you think is the needled, that, that, that pathway forward that balances a veteran's preference but also assures that our pipelines that get diversity, that get new recruits, what does that look like? Because then I think it's the city's job to design that and also yeah. ask for that to be passed at the State House as well. Yeah, I think, I think that has to be, um, we need to continue to think through that, but I think anything um, in the end goal, I think, has reservations for veterans, but also acknowledges that there should be slots left for other Boston residents, right? And so I do think, um, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, we, we should support veterans. Um, but I just don't think that it should be in 100% capacity, which leaves room for no one else. And so there are um, examples out there of um, cities who have done a 50% placement of veterans, 50% placement of public school kids, which I think is a great model if you want to talk about how do you tie in BPS and other initiatives. Uh, so I do think some balance of um, slotted preferences for uh, veterans, but room enough to allow um, for those who, uh, who, those who want to participate as well. Um, some balance of that system, I think. Thank you. That's all, Chair. Thank you uh, very much. Any follow-up questions of Council Flynn or Councilor uh, Baker at this time? Councilor Flynn. Thank you, I got a couple follow-up questions. Um, as it relates to the recruitment of cadets, uh, potential cadets, how, how would you do recruitment? Um, where would you recruit? And what would the process be like? So I could talk a little bit about the process for Boston Police Department. Um, the Boston Police Department recently had their cadet programs. I believe they had in excess of 300 applicants, um, which speaks to the need and the, and the want for these programs, right? Uh, there's a robust pro, um, process in terms of a background investigations, a psych evaluation, uh, which all recruits have to, um, have to participate in. Uh, so there's a rigorous um, backgrounds process that, you know, the public safety offices would be required to go through. You, that's the police you, you talked about. Yeah, but I, I'd imagine you'd have something um, similar in, in terms of public safety for the fire department as well. Um, like I said, this, this would be a new program, and so I would leave it to the uh, individuals in the fire department to, to talk about, you know, um, the programming and the structure of the department. They're the experts in the field. Um, but I do think, you know, it, it, it'd be sort of a robust backgrounds process in terms of um, physical engagement, um, you know, the background checks in terms of psych um, but, and all of that. Yeah, but my, my question is, is more geared toward recruiting. How would you recruit 
potential um, cadets for the fire department? The where the where would you look for them? The recruits would be, you know, in high schools, ROTC programs, um, community, like working with community leaders, community organizations like ABCD, BCYF, things that we're doing already, working in the high schools, career fairs, um, you know, uh, the similar outreach to what we do to get people to try to take the exam. It's all kind of one, you know. Um, I don't think it's any different for the cadet program. You know, I think that outreach has to be similar. I think uh, outreaching to young teens and, and you know, I, I think that's a, that's a route that we're going to focus on, young adults to try to, you know, get them prepared for a potential opportunity if this were to go through. And, well, I, and I, do, I, I do think recruitment would be one of the least of our issues. Um, as I mentioned, we have not had a single issue with recruitment. We ha we've had... Um, in excess of applicants in the police department. I think uh, that be folks would be thrilled to participate in the fire program. I don't think we'd have issue in terms of having to go out and find recruits. I think we'd have ample recruits in front of us. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I just want to make sure that I, I want to know what the, the, the process would be for, um, you know, recruiting. I think that's still important. Mm -hmm. I would like to see a, a lot of um, recruiting in our public school system. Mm. I'd love to see a lot of recruiting in public housing developments. I represent the largest, the most public housing of any councilor um, in the city, public housing along with, along with Councilor Baker. Um, you know, recruiting in public housing is critical. Um, I think those are all valid, um, Councilor Flynn, and we most certainly will work together to run a um, recruiting campaign and marketing and out outreach using various uh, methods, where, whether it be social media, which we know is big with the um, youth, so we'll make sure that we're doing that, but also just out there <coughs> talking to folks and letting people um, know that we are recruiting for a um, Boston Fire Department cadet program. And then forming, hopefully, what will be a pipeline for um, future cadet programs. Thank you. And who, during this process um, of, of, of recruiting, you go through the process, then who, who makes the decision of who becomes accepted as a, as a cadet? Again, we, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't know until uh, all the things have been flushed out and, and the details of the program um, <laughs> come out. It, there's no specifics just yet. Oh, so a lot of this still is working. It's still progress. in the works. Okay, correct. Um, what type? What type of recruitment would you do with um, language access issues? I mean, uh, uh, as far as recruitment for people with the, who can't speak uh, English, you're saying? Yes. Um, or, or, or English, English may be a second language. I mean, I, I guess we would have to, I think, visit that when we get to that point. I think figuring out, again, that's another detail that we have to work out with the HRD and figure out, um, you know, they'd have to go through the process. And that's kind of the whole process. Um, is it going to be similar to how civil service and the hiring process and in, in how what it's like to be a Boston firefighter? Is that process going to be similar? Um, we're still trying to work out those details. So there's nothing specific that I can give you that's going to help in, in terms of recruitment for, for language. And I think to your point, Councillor, I think there'd probably be something in terms of a, a language um, proficiency piece that would need to be um, accompanied in there. The other, the other piece that you may want to consider is, you know, some ethnic groups that might not be familiar with the fire department or the police department. Yes. Um, you know, we have to also consider cultural sensitivities about certain issues. Um, I, what, what are you what are you going to look at in terms of the cultural sensitivity issues? Um, in, in respect to what, in terms, can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, if you if you're doing recruiting um, for the cadet program of, of certain ethnic groups mm -hmm. um, that maybe maybe in their home country that they sure. didn't have a positive relationship with the police or with the or with the fire or with public safety agencies. Um, how are we going to overcome that obstacle? So, so I think any recruitment you do has to be robust in terms of making sure, number one, um, 
one, one thing we've done is on, on language access, making sure that we're able to translate content into um, native languages of Boston. Um, the other piece we're doing is being really intentional around um, getting, in getting in with local um, groups on the ground, letting them know what we're doing. Uh, we've gone on and done Haitian radio. We've gone on really on the ground and met folks where they're at, um, where we do our um, job series. We're in Mattapan, we're in Dorchester, we're meeting folks where they are. So I think it's the same type of process. You've got to be really intentional. Um, we do everything from lit dropping, because it works, to social media, to uh, language translations, um, to Facebook posts. So I think you've got to do it all. I think a huge part of that also is um, to the extent that we can, we are going to make certain that we have individuals that are currently um, in the fire department who may be able to communicate effectively mm -hmm. with a certain community. We're going to put them front and center and ask them for their assistance and recruiting you know, um, from various culture, cultural backgrounds, but also making sure that we're doing it appropriately. We need to talk to these individuals and have an understanding about, like you say, if there is some adversity with respect to where these um, individuals come from and making sure that we're not repeating those mistakes that perhaps have held them back in the past. No, I, I think that's an excellent point. I'm, I'm friendly with uh, the Deputy Fire Commissioner Connie Wong and she would be a, a great asset um, in terms of communicating. I know she does it all the time, but communicating with the Asian population. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to identify various firefighters um, across the city that might be in similar situations uh, that want to be part of this process, I would encourage you to reach out to them and get their, um, get their opinion on how we can better recruit and factoring in cultural sensitivity issues and, and, language, and language issues. And just on that, we've also been working with the Vulcans um, from the Boston Fire Department uh, in terms of recruitment. They've been excellent. Thank you. Any follow-up, Councilor Baker? Yeah, just one. Mr. Chair, thank you. So out of the 33% the that we're trying to go to the cadets, how would we, would that have, uh, Vivian, this is probably a few, how would we make sure that we could do a set aside? That has to happen through legislation, um, um, through, so we can't just set aside five seats, 10 seats for cadets or people that aren't necessarily DAVs. That has to happen legislatively? We have to work through that legislatively and, and look at that. And I'm sure, you know, as we, we've stated here, this is a work in progress. We will look at what, um, are the best practices out there in terms of others who have established cadet programs mm -hmm. and what is working um, as we work with the legislature and go through this process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Um, now it's time for public testimony. If there's anyone off, uh, willing to uh, offer public testimony, you may do so now or forever hold your peace, seeing and hearing no desire, no one also signed the sheet. So that will conclude the public testimony piece. So I'd just like to take this opportunity. It's always good to see you. See you, Vivian. So, Council, uh, can thank I you just, for your participation. And uh, Juan, you have fo follow-up. Yeah, can I just say I, one thing? I so, just just really briefly, um, you know, we've had this conversation different times in trying to create pathways and, and finding ways to increase demographics in the fire department, whether it's women, minorities. Um, but you know, we talk about veterans and we talk about civilians, and we have a whole untouched resource, um, which is the reservist. Right, we have reservists, you know, that aren't considered veterans that do serve, and it, and I think that that's a population that we could tap into, that could be beneficial to increase those numbers that we're looking for. Um, the, if we look at the numbers in terms of minorities and women that are reservists, I'm I'm pretty sure you'd be surprised how many we we do have. Um, so I think if we're going to go up to uh, up to uh, uh, the state house, I think that should be uh, something that we should look into as well. Um, I know there's laws that are in place that, you know, I think you have to uh, you have to do 90 days of active duty um, in order to become a veteran, um, and that is 90 days consecutive active duty days, not including training, right? 
So I think that that's kind of a resource that we can look into and that we should look into in the meantime while we're trying to work this out as well and trying to figure out how, what we can do to help the reservist people who did take that sacrifice and that oath to, to serve their country but aren't being recognized right now. They're kind of okay. being it's just vet or civilian, gotcha. you know? And I think these people should be looked at as well. Good, good point. I just I wanted to. Good point, and I think you're on the right track. Uh, for a takeaway, if someone could get me um, the latest civil service uh, round for, uh, for chief, uh, captain, and lieutenant. Uh, we spoke early on in the hearing about um, the need to restore those two district chief positions. And uh, not just the, the, the list, but also the demographic. I think we have a real opportunity to um, foster uh, diversity in the leadership positions of lieutenant captain and, and, uh, and chief by restoring those two chief positions, uh, particularly on the backfill. Um, so if um, if you guys could, someone could get that information, I don't know if that's Donnie or yeah, that's that Juan better yeah. suited, but mm -hmm. um, and feel free to reach out to, to Neil to get that to the committee. Sure. Uh, so our hope is to try to get a committee report turned around relatively short period of time and get it before the council for a vote so we can get up to Beacon Hill and. Uh, you guys have to continue to do what you guys do, which is the recruitment piece and the advocacy piece, and hopefully we can get, uh, we can make a cadet, a fire cadet program a reality in the city. So I appreciate your time and attention. Um, Donnie Tavares, uh, Chief Diversity Officer, uh, Juan Sanchez, Diversity Officer of the Boston Fire Department, and Vivian Leonard, Director of Human Services. So unless you guys have anything else for me, uh, we can conclude. Very good. So with respect to uh, docket 0173, petition for a special law regarding fire cadet program in the city of Boston for our Boston Fire Department, the Committee on Government Operations is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.